Scripture reading comes from Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Turn in your Bibles, electronic devices. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Word of the Lord. So as I look around the world and I reflect on the news stories, it can quickly assess, it's quickly seen and understood that most of the people in this world have been at one time or another confronted by people who really would gladly kill them. I don't think any of us has ever not experienced someone who despises you. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear any amends on that one, did I? No. You see, the news has a customary list of nations that hate nations. You know, it, it seems like in my whole lifetime, it's never changed. The list is, you know, we've had some division in Russia and some new countries formed with the breaking up of the Soviet Union, but the traditional hatreds are still there for one another. Just ask any Pakistani, he can't stand an Afghan. My son who served over there will tell you that. People hate people. And what's even more interesting to me is inside of religious groups like Islam, Islam has two different sects. And they hate each other because each of them thinks they have the true words of the prophet Muhammad. And they despise the other sect. So you have nations fighting nations in the same religious group. By the way, the Christians aren't much better if you go back to the pre-Reformation days and even during the Reformation days. Around the world, certain people groups hurt, hate certain people groups. In Africa, where there's tribalism still going on, or South America, where tribalism still exists, there are tribes within the same country who dislike each other who literally have traditional hatred. Around the world, we see these people are mortal enemies historically and remain so currently. And by the way, America is no different. Tensions may be growing around the world, but tensions are really growing here in the United States too. Um, The news is full of political and social division in our country. It's deep, And it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And my problem is not with the disagreements from different viewpoints. It's that the rhetoric that I'm hearing in the news sounds like each side hates the other side. So they're not going to sit down and have any conversations on compromise. Each side wishes the other side would just cease to exist and fall off the face of the earth. There's a deep hatred. And by the way, what I'm I'm just talking about really just scratches the surface of what's happening around the world and in our nation. It seems like the media and others, especially social media, just wants to always create enemy against enemy. They define people as enemies of, because you disagree with me, you're my enemy. And by the way, this is really, really tough stuff. And it's real. It's happening. And I think my heartache and my heartbreak is for when I hear people of Christian faith who are actually vehemently angry and really despising another person of Christian faith's viewpoint on some of these issues. And there's no dialogue. All there is is anger. And by the way, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, we find out that one of the characteristics of the heart of God is not to be an angry person, right? So if we're a true follower of Jesus Christ, why are we angry? Hmm. 
They don't really, at times, want to talk the issues. They want to spew their thoughts. They want to spew their anger and hatred. And the world is looking at us and said, what difference does your Christ make? Because you're no different than how I feel. So what I see happening more and more is this language of discord and this uh, agreement has grown and people are now despising one another. A lot of it comes because of our unwillingness just to sit down and have dialogue with one another. To sit down and actually listen to the other person's point of view and have a discussion about it. No one's saying, Jesus is not saying, that you have to have 100% agreement on every issue as Christians. No, that's why Paul says we look at all these issues and outside of salvation, sin and salvation, and what the Bible declares as sin, all these other issues, what do we do? We pray, we study Scripture, and we decide based on the conscience as the Holy Spirit lives with us, which means there are going to be some Christians who are a little bit more progressive, but they're going to be in heaven with us, and there are some who are really, 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 really conservative and fundamental, and they're going to be in heaven with us, and somehow we're all going to have to worship together the Lamb who was slain. And my guess is, because God has this great sense of humor, He's going to take that right-wing fundamentalist that I, I, I actually have a problem with because I don't think it shows the grace and mercy of God in some of their positions, and he's going to put me right next to them for all eternity. And they want to sing the hymn slow, and I want, yeah, let's rock and roll. And he's going to say, love them, because he's saying that now. This is real stuff. You know, and, 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 and really, if we think about it personally, I doubt that there's few of us here who will manage to get through life without someone being ex happy or not disappointed when we die. Because we all make enemies, right? There are some people who, when I pass away, will say, oh, I'm glad that Christian idiot was gone, is gone. True. I believe it. It's okay. By the way, Jesus understood that because they despised him. They rejected him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They crucified him. They shouted, crucify him, crucify him. By the way, political, this political thing that's going through, this hatred we see in this generation, by the way, all you have to do is go back to uh, World War II era, uh, Winston Churchill and Lady Ashton, you know, they didn't get along. She said to Winston one time, Sir Winston Churchill, she said, if I was your wife, I would drink a cup of tea with arsenic in it. <laughs> or maybe it was that she said, I would make a cup of tea with arsenic in it for you to drink, and he said, I would gladly drink it. I've heard it both ways. But there was real hatred and disagreement between them. This, this goes on in every generation. The Jewish people of that generation hated Roman rule. They hated King Herod's rule. There were political factions that despised each other. And then there were those who practiced the faith a certain way, and they despised those who wouldn't do it the proper way, the way they were telling them how to do it, because they weren't as good as them. They didn't tithe like they tithe. And so you have a Pharisee who stands in church and says one day, what? Hey, I'm glad I'm not like that dirty sinner on the ground over there next to me. You know, the culture norm that Jesus understood was this. If they seek your destruction, we seek to destroy them. If they despise us, we despise them back. If they want to hurt our family, we hurt their family in kind. If they hate us, we hate them. It's the right thing to do. And so what does Jesus say? You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, this is commonplace. By the way, if you watch any TV shows, you'll know one of the major themes that TV writers love to use is someone hurts this person who now seeks revenge on those people who hurt him or his family. I don't know how many of you watch Blue Bloods. I watch Blue Bloods. But Danny's house got burned down and his wife got killed, and he's finding out episode after episode, even into two seasons later, He's still discovering who killed Linda, and he wants a pound of flesh. That's how our culture is. Jesus responds to this cultural mindset 
with something when I'm sure that when it hit the ears of his hearers, and even as I read it today, it is hard to fathom how we would do this. But he says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. By the way, it's a command. It's an imperative in the Greek form. It is a command. You must do this. He's not suggesting, oh, I think you should like that person anyway. So if you get a chance, could you just work it into your life to start liking him and treating him nicely, be polite? No, Jesus absolutely says you need to love them. Agape love is a love of concrete action. It's not the love of the emotions, not the love of feelings. It is the love of concrete action. Love, Jesus says, is to be expressed constantly. The, Hebrew ver the Greek verb form here says that this should be a habit of our life, that we continually should love our enemies. Ooh, that's hard, isn't it? How many of you are sweating a little bit? No, you have a list of people. Do I have to really love them? No, Jesus says you have to love them. But loving them is tolerating them too. See, biblical love is never an abstract thought. It is concrete action. It is active action. When Jesus commands us to love our enemies, he expects us to do it. To love those who have contempt for you. To love those who regularly fantasize for your pain and your destruction. Because in loving them, you act as God acts. Think about that for a second. Jesus says, for God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. This is what we call in theology common grace. Common grace is the grace that extends the blessings and benefits of God to all mankind. God extends his unmerited favor, his grace, his mercy, in some form or another to those who believe and those who don't believe, even those who curse at him, even those who are worshiping other gods. He does this by allowing the sun to shine and the rain to fall that produces food that allows the people to nourish their bodies and to live. The rain that fell this morning is a demonstration of God's common grace to all mankind. He just doesn't put rain on this farm field because they're believers and he doesn't like these people who they're worshiping and so he doesn't put rain on their fields. In common grace, God is undiscriminatory or indiscriminatory. And we also have to remember this neat thing as a follower of Jesus Christ, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, this heart of the kingdom, we need to remember that while we were enemies of God because of our sin, and that's exactly what the Bible calls us, because of the sin in our life, we stood outside of his justice and outside of his holiness that he called us an enemy. So that while we were his enemy, he demonstrated his love for us. For God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Think about how much love that is. That while we were unworthy, while we were on the opposite side, maybe worshiping false gods and mocking him. He loved us enough to die for us so that he could restore the relationship with us. Jesus, you know, he doesn't miss the point. He just likes to rub it on a little bit because he says, you know, what good is it to love people who like you? It's easy when someone is praising you and patting you on the back and saying you're good to like them back. Let's face it. Anybody remember the Godfather movies? If you remember the, fir the first Godfather movie, you quickly get the sense that that statement is true because those who were in the family, who were part of the mafioso, there were certain rules. And you're part of the family. They loved you and cared for you, and they took care of you, and they liked you because you were part of the family. 
They took care of their own. I mean, come on, even prisoners in jail have certain unwritten rules that everyone seems to follow that demonstrate that if you like us, we like you. But if you don't like us, hey, you're in trouble. The follower of Jesus, though, he's, if he's living with the kingdom heart because of the union with God, is transformed. Our hearts, our behavior, should visibly reveal the heart of God to everyone around us. It should reveal how we love others, how we care for them, and what we say, and what we do, how we treat them, especially those who despise us. It's out of a relationship with God that we discover the power of love and its ability to heal, its ability to change the messed up life, its ability to heal the broken, to bind up the wounds of those who are broken, to give hope to the hopeless. It's flowing out of that loving relationship with God that all this is possible. The love we share flows out of that relationship. So I remember a time when someone was diagnosed with prostate cancer and their family had vehemently attacked my leadership in a different church. And there was great tension in the church over this. There was a church split about ready to happen. And I went down and sat with the family with Sue for a whole day while we waited for them to come out of the prostate cancer surgery and to see what the doctors had to say. Did I like going? No. Was it comfortable? It was absolutely not because when you're sitting in the big waiting room of that hospital, people were looking at me who were on the other side of this issue in the church and they didn't know what to say, but they were not friendly smiles. But God had told me that morning in prayer I needed to go. So I went and showed them the love of Christ that I couldn't emotionally feel but I could act in. That love flowed out of relationship with God. So what is love? We use this word all the time. We love our car. We love hot dogs. We love baseball. We love football. We love the <coughs> Seahawks. Go Broncos! Football season is here. I almost wore my football jersey today. And we use love all the time. We say we love our spouse, but I hope you love your spouse differently than you love the mustard on your hot dog. You know what I mean? And in the English language, we use this word all the time. Love, love, love. And it means so much. But it's so confusing. Paul describes what love looks like. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable, resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. This is one we forget sometimes in marriages. Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, and by the way, people love prophecy, right? But Paul declares to the inspiration of the Scripture, of the, of the Holy Spirit, that prophecies are going to pass away. As for tongues, sign gifts, they will cease. And as for knowledge, which I think is one of the big things in the church, we want you to have more knowledge. We want you to have more know God. We want you to know God. And we dump knowledge on you, but it will also pass away. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Paul says it differently to the church at Ephesus. He says, I want you to know his love, the height, the depth, the width, the length of his love that surpasses knowledge so that the fullness of God can live within you. That's what we're talking about as someone who has a kingdom heart, who's living the Beatitudes, who's living out the Sermon on the Mount. In these practical situations we handle differently than the world because this love of God is flowing out of us, because of our relationship with God. And the only reason why we can love the enemy is because of that relationship with God. It's a decision of our will to love. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 14.1, just after this verse, Paul says, pursue love. 
He doesn't say pursue more knowledge. He doesn't say pursue more church members. He doesn't say pursue more Sunday school programs. He says pursue love. Pursue that relational love that you have with God. See, it's, it's not a checklist of things we do. It's not. The type of love that we're talking about flows out of our heart because our heart has become aligned with the Father's heart, with God's heart. And so therefore, I'm not trying to master something. I'm trying to live it every day in real terms and in real ways. The things I say to people, how I treat people, what I do in community. When I'm pursuing this as salt and light in the community, this, this love becomes second nature and my behavior changes. And quite frankly, I'm even stunned at times that I find myself praying for and loving someone who I know does not like my theological values and my theological viewpoint in Jesus Christ. And they would tell you to their face they don't like what I think. They would tell me to my face and have. But I find myself stunned because now I hurt for them and I mourn for them and the sin in their life because I wanted to know a Savior named Jesus Christ. This type of godly living, this lifestyle of salt and life, does change my behavior, does change my attitude, because I'm abiding in God's love. I'm abiding in that relationship. And as, as a result, what happens is I all of a sudden, I change. And I all of a sudden, I'm no longer short-tempered. Ask my kids. My, my, <laughs> my oldest daughter is amazed. She says, how come you can be patient with my kids, but you couldn't be patient with us? I grew into it. But because I'm trying to live in this relationship with Jesus Christ, and I work every day at living in this relationship with Jesus Christ, I find that I have become more gentle, and I become more patient. I have become one who is really seeking the mercy and pursuing righteousness, who actually really is hungering and thirsting. I want a better relationship with God. Every day, it seems like my journal I'm writing... I want more of you, Jesus. I want more of you, Holy Spirit. Correct this behavior. Change this in me. Because I want to be more and more like Jesus. It's because I'm abiding in that relationship. So I have become humble. I have become merciful. I'm becoming salt and light. That's the type of love we're talking about here. So do you truly love people who are not like you? Do you truly love someone who isn't in your ethnic background? Maybe who doesn't dress like you? Do you love those who hate you? If a drug addict on meth who's high comes into church with you and they sit down next to you, what are you going to do? If someone who hasn't showered in what seems to be a long, long, long time sits down next to you, you're going to love on them or you're going to care for them? What are you going to do? How do you greet people of ethnic, different ethnic backgrounds than you? Especially here in the church. It's a real story. I remember reading a number of years ago about this Korean pastor who was, he had come to know Jesus Christ and he was living his life for Christ. And all of a sudden one day God says, I want you to go to uh, Japan and preach the gospel. I want you to preach the good news of my love to Japanese. And he said, God, really? Because he, he remembered what it was like pre-World War II. The atrocities upon which the Japanese soldiers inflicted on the Koreans. The horror of their behavior toward them and the hatred of their actions had instilled within him a hatred for Japanese. And he couldn't even begin to think and stomach that he could go to Japan and even tell them about Jesus. Because he really wanted them to burn in hell. But God didn't let him go. God kept talking to him. And the next thing you know, he says, I'm on a plane. I'm going to Japan to go to the church that had called me there to preach. And I got up that day not wanting to do it. And I walked into the pulpit. And then something miraculous happened. A warmth flowed over my body. And I felt the presence of God in a way I'd never have. And with tears in my eyes, I preached the love of Jesus Christ to people who I hated. And my heart was softened and my heart was changed. And all of a sudden, I found myself loving Japanese. 
So how do we love our enemies? How do we do good things for them? How do we act in kindness? Proverbs put it this way, if, you're, if your enemy is hungry, give him food, bread to eat, and if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. What helps me is I remember they're image bearers of God. That somewhere underneath all their hatred toward me and all their disagreement with me, there is a person who was created by God and bears his image. So the question then becomes, can you intentionally do good things toward those who despise you? The Bible says, yes, you can. The kingdom heart shows love in practical ways. Maybe you give them food to eat and water to drink. Maybe you find clothes for their kids. Maybe you find housing for them. See, as followers of Jesus Christ, who are living the kingdom values, who have a kingdom heart, our treatment of others does not depend on how they treat us or what they say to us or how they act toward us. Rather, our behavior and our actions toward them are entirely controlled by the love of God in Christ Jesus that we have living with us that helps us to love them. We should not act out. We should not allow other people's actions or behaviors to influence how we behave to them. Rather, we need to push away that old attitude and that old mindset aside, and we need to bury it under the blood of the Lamb, and we need to all of a sudden have a new attitude as a disciple of Jesus Christ that even though they disagree with me and are on the opposing side and they really don't like me, I'm going to demonstrate love to them in Christ Jesus because that's what God did for me in Christ. Stop letting others control your behavior. Let the Holy Spirit control your behavior. Let the Holy Spirit be the one who's in charge of your life. So what do you do? How do you demonstrate kindness? One of the, one of the first ways is very easy. You can bless them. To bless is to make a verbal pronouncement of God's goodness and graciousness, graciousness or favor on their life. You can, you can actually say, God be with you. God act upon your life. You can pray the Deuteronomic blessing, the Lord be with you and keep you and lift his face, shall his face shine upon you and lift you up into his countenance. We speak blessing over their life. And we pray for them. We have a conversation with God. And we do not pray, God, get him for me. I want to see your revenge. You know, the Bible says, Lord, vengeance is mine, says, Lord, I'll repay. So dump it on him, baby. Yeah. We've prayed that prayer, haven't we? But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. That's not what God is asking us. He's saying, pray for my presence to be in their life. Pray that the Holy Spirit who convicts people into sin, righteousness, and repentance will be revealed, that they will have a change of heart. They will discover God's eternal peace in a living relationship with God. And let me tell you a secret. If you pray for your enemies, those people who bug you, that neighbor who despises you, the neighbor who hates you, your dogs or, or doesn't like the fact that you, you, know, you leave at 7 in the morning and you make a noise that wakes them up from their sleep because they're retired, whatever it is. And you start praying for people who don't like you. You discover that all of a sudden you have the ability to love them. And how much you love them is going to blow you away. Because when you pray for your enemies, two things happen. You change, and they change. Maybe, just maybe, the starting point of loving someone is just praying for their salvation. To ardently pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal himself, and that they would repent and believe, and ask the question, what do I have to do to be saved? When was the last time you prayed for your enemy's salvation? When was the last time you prayed for their family or where they work or your work with people who disagree with you? Jesus did. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen had rocks bouncing off his body and head. And he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He was praying for his enemies. Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Really, God, I have to pray for those who are inflicting pain in my life? I have to pray for those 
who hurt my family? You see, to be persecuted because of righteousness is to align yourself according to the Beatitudes with the prophets, right? Yet to bless and pray for those who persecute you is to align yourself with the character and heart of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to be aligned with God's character and God's heart. Now, let's be truthful for a moment. Is it hard? Absolutely! <laughs> Absolutely. It's one of the hardest things you can do is to hate someone who has inflicted pain upon your life or maybe your family's life. I've had people try to mine information about my family through my daughter, through their granddaughter. So their granddaughter would ask certain questions to my daughter, trying to get information what happens in our house because they wanted to use it against me. And God says, you have to love them and pray for them. Was that hard? Absolutely. Absolutely. But being a follower of Jesus Christ means that I am asked to do this by God. I'm actually commanded to do this by God. And so by so doing it, it reveals my heart. And by the way, the more I work at it and do it, it starts to become a natural expression of who I am and who you are in Christ Jesus. I can't do this without Jesus Christ helping me. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. But as a follower of Jesus, I can change my attitudes, my actions, my behaviors because Christ is living within me. Bertrand Russell was a British philosopher of the last century. Well published, had a lot of interesting thoughts. He left the Christianity of his childhood to become an atheist. He had a lot of problems with the church. And he wrote this. He said, the Christian principle, love your enemies, is good. There's nothing against it except that it's too difficult for most of us to practice sincerely. Absolutely. He's absolutely right. From his perspective, he was trying to think how hard it was for himself and for others to do in their own strength. Catch that? It is almost impossible to do if you try to do it in your own strength. One of the reasons his longtime acquaintances said that this was a struggle for him is that his life was filled with hatred. He never allowed the God of his childhood to heal his wounds. He never was willing to set aside the hatred. He let it fester and grow and dominate his life. His fallacy, like others who fall in the same camp, is when we view things with the mental attitude that we need to keep the law, we need to have this checklist, and so we focus on doing the right external behaviors, hoping that will get us into heaven, and hoping that God will give us a little star next to our name. Maybe we'll get a brownie in heaven with a little extra chocolate sauce and whipped cream on it because we did the right thing. And we have this let's do mentality. But the Bible asks us to allow the natural process of transformation occur in our life because our heart is being conformed to God's heart because of the depth of our relationship with God in Jesus Christ. We love our enemies and we love those who persecute us. We love our grouchy neighbor not with the reciprocating love because they love us, but rather with the love of God who loves them even when they're wrong, even when they're mocking him, and even when they're disagreeing with God and running in rebellion, he still loves them. That's the type of love that he's asking us to have. It's the type of love that touches everyone we encounter in life. And they have no power to change that. We sometimes think they have the power to change these things in our life. They have no power over us. It's the love of God powerfully flowing out of us to others because it's truly who we are because we are in a natural relationship with Jesus Christ. 
the core of our being is walking with Jesus Christ and living as salt and light in the world. And because of that, we don't just do something right or proper or moral or correct because we have to. We do these things because it flows out of a relationship, out of the fellowship of spending time with God in His glorious presence. And so what happens is we allow our hearts to connect to His hearts, His heart. And we're changed. And all of a sudden, we can still disagree with our neighbor. We can still disagree with that person who has a political viewpoint that we absolutely despise. But we can love them. We can pray for them. We can ask God to reveal himself and bless them. You see, that's, that's so important because it's so hard. Let me, let me just tell you, I love Sue with all my heart. There, I just can't express it any other way. She was the love of my life. That's very true. And somehow as we're cleaning up the house and moving things around, I found a couple of journals, and the poor girl thought I was the best gift from God that she could ever have. I feel sorry for her. If I'm the best, she's, you know. But we loved each other. But those of you who knew Sue knew that we didn't always agree on how to parent children. We didn't always agree on things. And, and my Sue would tell you her viewpoint. She was not a wallflower. She would let you know what she was thinking. And so we could have vehement disagreements. Almost sound like we were enemies. We loved each other. So we stay engaged in the relationship. We continue to work through those issues. Ethan said to me just the other day, he said, Dad, uh, what I'm really impressed about is even when Mom was acting out, that was his words, acting out or being hard to live with, you somehow loved her no matter what you did. And I'm telling you, it's not because of anything that I did. It's because I had a relationship with God that connected my heart with my Jesus and I wanted to love Sue as much as he loved her. That's what God is calling us to do here in the Sermon on the Mount, to love those that we disagree with, to love with those who we have political opposition to, to those who hate us and despise us, who will say all manner of evil to us. And he says, will you love them in concrete ways? Will you pray for them? Will you pray blessing on their life? Will you pray for their salvation? Will you do acts of kindness to them? doesn't matter that you don't deserve it. Do the kindness anyway. That's the type of love, of concrete action from the depths of our relationship with God that he's calling us to do for those who are enemies, those who persecute us, who mock us, who scorn us. Will you love them like Jesus loved them? Will you see them the way Jesus sees them? as a person who needs to encounter the love of someone in Christ Jesus so their life can be changed as the Holy Spirit works through you to model God's love in their life and to touch them with the everlasting love of a God who will never turn their back on them and who will redeem them. In a world that's full of hatred and division, God is calling us more and more to love people. Will you love them? Father God, I just thank you for these words. And Lord, I just ask that you would uh, help us to love those who don't like us. Help us to love those who despise us. Help us to love those who persecute us because we follow you. And we have values and beliefs that are rooted in our relationship with you. Give us the strength. Give us the wisdom to speak great words. But help us to love them the way you love them, Father with all our heart because your power flows through us and helps us to love them. I confess, Father, I can't do it on my own. So help me do it, Father. Father, as we continue in worship, may you stir our hearts. May you move us to be a more loving, caring people. For your glory and your glory alone. In the name of Christ.